before uh, we begin this panel, uh, I just wanted to make a point of clarification. There were a couple of uh, comments about why uh, a specific uh, uh, symposium on violence against Muslim women. Uh, we discussed this uh, first thing in the morning. Some may not have been here. The idea was by no means to say that there is more of a case of violence against women in Muslim societies, but uh, to recognize that violence is across the board in all societies, across all the various uh, divisions that people have. But we would like to talk about, concentrate on this, well, partly because Muslim women do not often get a chance to speak out or to voice their condition in the international fora. Unfortunately, this is the case. If we hadn't organized this particular symposium, we wouldn't be heard. So this is the space where we can talk about what we are doing, some of the challenges and some of the uh, achievements. At the same time, we don't get to engage in dialogue across uh, to hear what other people do, uh, what, uh, what uh, strategies they're using, and how they respond to what we're doing. So the dialogue is very necessary for us. So we're not in any way pointing fingers at these uh, societies by any means. We are just simply sharing with others, especially in view of the fact that we don't usually get the chance to do this. Uh, now, uh, this uh, uh, last panel of ours is going to be concentrating on <coughs> women's empowerment and how that relates to the issue of violence. Excellent uh, commentary uh, was made in the previous panel and in the panel before that with regards to the question of patriarchy, which is in fact an essential matter to pay attention to when we talk about power. Uh, you know, uh, we have all been familiar with the idea that patriarchy is a system that is a very hierarchical system. Usually men, always men at the top, whether it's within the family or whether it's within the community or whether it's within uh, governments or the international community for that matter. Men and then women and then men of different ages and so forth. The, uh, the, the way uh, uh, patriarchy is organized is, in fact, a very holistic, very reasonable, and very well-supported system. We don't like the premises, but within those premises, everything is very well organized. You have religion supporting it, you have culture supporting it, you have the media supporting it, and then also there are answers for everything. If men are in charge of families, then men go out and earn money. Then what happens, women stay and, and, and take care of children and take care of the uh, uh, private space affairs under the direction of the male. And also everything, including the way people work, the structures of workplaces, even designs of, of the spaces where we live and work and, and market are based on the patriarchal system. You live in the suburbs, go to work in the city, the woman who stays behind drives a car and does her shopping in the shopping centers and comes home and child care is generally not available. So the whole system is very well thought out, holistic, rational, and well supported. Now, Yakin, I think it was uh, specifically mentioning uh, the matter of transformation of this system. I think others did as well. Now, if we, and also the matter of the movement, uh, which uh, a number of uh, speakers previously and a number of people uh, who commented mentioned, if we're going to transform and change this system to another system, which is based on equality and justice, to change the power relationship, which is the underlying cause of violence and injustice, if we're going to do that, we also need to have a holistic, rational, that is in the sense of the various pieces fitting together nicely, cohesive uh, system to replace the other system. Now, in order to do that, we can't do it with the rules of the old system. That is, we can't ask for uh, participatory, uh, 
egalitarian, tolerant, diverse society within the structures that already exist, because the structures are the opposite of what we want. So even though we have tried for many years and succeeded uh, uh, considerably in bringing numbers of women into leadership positions and positions of power, we have not really even begun to change the structures to reflect a different kind of relationship. So this is what we need to do, both to sort of rise above, uh, above our diversity and differences, mobilize around the general uh, consensus that we have on rights and on equality and on justice, and at the same time, take up practices that resemble and reflect the kind of society that we want. The patriarchal order is based on what we call masculine values of aggressiveness, competitiveness, acquisitiveness, material possessions. These are the things that, and people have a pecking order. This is the boss needs to know, the second one is this, that, and the other. We cannot have the other kind of system that we seek playing this game. It's important to have numbers of women, but at the same time, we need to reorganize the system. And this is why uh, we have been, and by we, I mean the partnership that we work with and uh, the, those who are on this uh, uh, panel and uh, many of the others on previous panels are part of this partnership. And I'm very pleased that some of these ideas that we're talking about are coming from the Global South and they are coming from Muslim societies, which are supposed to be really quite not with it in terms of these issues. And I'm very <laughs> pleased that there has been that kind of innovation uh, in terms of how to organize leadership situations, define leadership in ways that are conducive to what we're talking about uh, for the kind of societies that we wish to achieve. Now, the principles of this kind of leadership that we collaboratively have come about are that one, everybody is or can be a leader either simultaneously a leader and a follower, or sometimes a leader, sometimes a follower. So this is the principal assumption. So leadership is not something charismatic that some people have and some people just don't have. Everybody has that. Everybody has the possibility of doing that. The other aspect of leadership is that the basis of leadership is communication. You cannot be a leader unless there's somebody who communicates with you. There have to be at least two people if you're going to have a situation of leadership. And so there has to be communication between the people in order to uh, bring about leadership. There, then there has to be not a message from one person or from, from one group of people that will be relayed to others, but that messages and meanings are created together, that people create their vision of what they want to see in the world together. So there's a collaborative, communicative, participatory process by which the egalitarian uh, leadership that we're talking about can be reached. And so this is uh, the, the uh, con uh, conceptual, uh, uh, actually, underpinnings of that uh, leadership. The other aspect of it is also that we practice what we preach in our work. That is, nobody makes decisions for others. They are not uh, curriculum developed in one place and translated for others. We develop our curriculum together. And our teaching tools or our curriculum are, in fact, scenario-based. That is, we have stories of women who have succeeded, who have uh, uh, actually uh, faced leadership crises or situations. And then we have interactive meetings where people discuss easily, one step removed from themselves, how they would solve those situations, those crises. And through that process and through that discussion, they come to agree or not agree, but accept that they might not, might not agree, to reach consensus, to agree to disagree if they don't, but for the most part to agree on a vision, on an idea, on a plan of action, on how to move from uh, position A to position B. 
I'm describing this to you not simply for PR purposes of telling you about WLP, which is of course part of it, but the major part of it is because if we're talking about elimination of violence, we're talking about power. We're talking about eliminating the aggression of one group over another. We're, we're talking about understanding, about tolerance, about a culture of peace, about a different world that we want to make that we as feminists, as women activists want to make. And in order to make that world, we have to approach the entire uh, uh, situation of ourselves, our families, communities, and the world differently. So we have to start from scratch, rebuild, and transform. So this is the image that, uh, that I want to leave you with as we go to our uh, colleagues who will describe to you uh, different uh, aspects of, of uh, uh, the uh, type of leadership that I've been talking about. There will be a discussion of uh, the attempt of our partners in Morocco, ADFM, who have successfully led a group of collaborative uh, uh, NGOs to change the family status laws and they have uh, taken important steps uh, in the direction of, of uh, uh, formulating uh, legislation against harassment and other forms of violence. The Zeno Anwar uh, will be uh, from Sisters uh, in Islam from Malaysia will be talking about an earlier effort that produced uh, um, uh, really uh, uh, important and innovative legislation on violence, and she will talk about implementation of that and how do you actually make it happen, make it make a difference in people's lives. And uh, Hafsat Abiola will be uh, coming, just coming from Nigeria, a board member of, of uh, WLP and, and uh, uh, a good uh, partner of ours. She has just come from an institute in Nigeria that uh, Baobab and WLP organized together, and she'll talk about that actual experience in relation to to this whole concept of, of leadership and empowerment. I think I reversed the order or mixed it up actually. I think Hafsat will go first and uh, uh, Rabia Nasiri from uh, Morocco will go next and, and uh, Zeno will be the last. Thank you very much. Thank you Manaz. Um, Um, in 1999, I returned to Nigeria from doing a lot of work on the pro-democracy movement for Nigeria to start um, my, an NGO that I run there on, women, on promoting women, women's leadership. Because my work had actually come from building, um, been, being part of building a pro-democracy movement, I didn't have a very strong background in women's leadership. So it was a blessing when Manaz invited me to become um, to, to join um, the Board of Directors for Women's Learning Partnership. And at each board meeting that I attended for WLP, <coughs> Manaz um, would talk about leadership as creating opportunities for empowerment. Now, I didn't understand what she meant, but I'd gone to um, university in the United States, and that meant that you, you learn very early, if you don't understand, how to nod and smile and still look intelligent, like, as if you really grasp what the person is saying, but I was just looking at my and I was like, uh-huh, right, um, <laughs> what is that? And um, also fortunately for me, in, um, earlier this, um, this, well, we're March 1 now, a few weeks ago in February, um, Women's Learning Partnership convened a Sub-Saharan Africa Leadership Institute with their Nigeria partner, Baobab for Women's Human, Human Rights. And I was invited also because I'm on the board of um, WLP to attend that um, leadership institute. Really was an eye opener for me. And so m m all I'm, what I want to share with you today is what we experienced over the five days of the women's, um, leadership, um, women's leadership institute that was held in Nigeria. It, had, it brought together women from across the sub-Saharan Africa, from Gambia, from Cameroon, from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Tanzania. And these women came together to work on learning how to become trainers and facilitators of the unique model of leadership 
um, training that um, WLP has pioneered. I was going into that institute and so were all the other Nigerians from a really um, degrading past two weeks. You see, in Nigeria now, as I'm speaking to you, our government is convening a national political reform conference, very much like what they had in South Africa, where they're looking at how to move the country forward. The whole pro-democracy activist community in Nigeria have been demanding that after over two decades of military rule in Nigeria, that we really needed to look at how we move forward. We can't just um, rush into democracy and suppose we know what that means. There are ethnic and religious fault lines in the country, we have to address them. Resource allocation issues, we have to address them. So we've been asking for this opportunity and finally our government responded and convened a gathering of about 400 delegates of which 31 were women, and the government told us that this was 9%, which told me that their calculator wasn't working because that's 7.74%. And, and one of the states that sent, um, each state sent five delegates and there were other interest groups represented. One of the states, Ondo State, sent um, five delegates, including one woman, and that woman, her name is Dr. Mrs. Alebiosu, they said, holds a doctorate degree but our candidature was criticized by, this, um, by people in the state. And finally, the government spokesperson said she was included by the state to keep up with the Beijing affirmative action. There was just one woman of the five delegates in that state, and they had to even justify why that woman was on the, delega on the delegation team. And, you know, we've just been in the midst of that. And our president, I think, to reassure, to really confirm for women our place in case we were confused, um, they'd convened this um, conference, an annual lecture, where Grasa Michelle Mandela was invited to come and be the keynote speaker, dynamic, brilliant woman that she is. She arrives in Nigeria and she tells us, oh, um, Nigerian women need to start focusing on their rights and not on their roles. And our president, who was chairing the event, gets up after she has spoken and tells and, and, ex and says to us, I mean, I think translating our English to Nigerian English, she tells us, well, women can advance their rights through pillow talk. You know, and this actually happened, I think this was um, the 15th of February, and um, the Women's Learning Partnership Leadership Institute started on the 20th of um, February. So as we were going into that conference, I personally felt like a fraud. Here we are going into this conference on women's leadership, and we're allowing our public spaces to exclude women so clearly you know, there was no contest, I mean, there was contesta contestation, but it wasn't re yielding results. So when we gathered um, for this conference from all over the um, Sub-Saharan Africa, other women from other parts of Africa were coming with similar stories. From Ghana, they're trying to push a domestic bill um, against violence against women. And um, the, woman, um, the woman that is the Minister for Women's Affairs has demanded that they withdraw the language in the bill that um, addresses marital rape, saying that there's no such thing as marital rape. And one of the delegates also was the Minister for Women's Affairs from Liberia, coming for the Leadership Institute, and she shared how when she took over the um, ministry in Liberia, for chairs they had bricks that they put on the floor for people to sit on, showing the allocation of resources to that ministry in the, for women, um, to bring women's voices into the, into the public space of rebuilding Liberia, which is a post-conflict situation. So we were all really feeling quite battered. And we started the conference with um, Baobab facilitating. Baobab is um, a, n a national NGO in Nigeria that especially works in the northern part of Nigeria around the violence that women face in the implementation of Sharia law. But they work also in other parts of the country around customary law issues. And they've been a partner of Women's Learning Partnership, learning this facilitation model for about two years now. And they were facilitating the training of trainers. And in the course of their facilitation, they talked to us about how in facilitating, you're not supposed to be a judge, you're not supposed to be an expert, that you're only supposed to be trying to get the best of the group, you're supposed to be helping the group learn. We looked at what, it, what does it mean to have an organization called Women's Learning Partnership? What does learning partnership mean? Many people were, um, were, had difficulty with that um, description and with that um, naming. And then we realized that in all our societies, we come from spaces that we're taught about tradition. And my people, my ethnicity is Yoruba. And in Yor among the Yorubas, we're often taught, oh, this is the way we do this. 
as if the, that way can never be questioned, can never be changed. And for me personally, I felt like this was a dead society, a society that is not open to any changes as well as is as good as dead. But learning society is dynamic, it's open, it's open to growth, it's open to transformation. So we, we, we um, grappled with the meaning of learning partnership. Then we looked at how could we as a community learn together, which was what Baobab facilitated, the process that they facilitated over the next five days. We did things like role playing. We, we all come from, uh, all the people that gathered were different religions, Islamic, um, Christian, different classes, different age groups, different ethnicities. We had all kinds of fault lines, even within our own small group. But with the um, process that we were embarking on, we used case studies that didn't have to do with our own particular issues, so that we could, in the course of discussing those case studies, we could be open. We wouldn't feel like, oh, as a Yoruba, I shouldn't say this because it would be a betrayal of my people. Or as um, someone from Ghana, I shouldn't say this other thing. We we're very open um, using case studies that were from Jordan or other countries so that, you know, we didn't feel like our identity was being called into question. It, w it made it very easy for us. And then we also um, worked with um, um, role playing where we acted plays and which had a lot of us laughing. We had so many actresses in that group. If there's anyone from Hollywood, um, I, would, I would love to give you some contact information for you know, actresses from Africa. There were really good actresses among us. We were all laughing and learning at the same time. Then we did something called Creating News where we um, planned the news of the day. And because the present situation is so dismal, dismal um, one of the, um, the um, news reporters planned the news 10 years from now and gave us a future perfect news of us having achieved so many of our goals, which made many of us feel really empowered. And then as the days progressed, um, through the process of facilitation, we came to a collective vision. And from that collective vision, the spirit within our community just flourished. We came to, our energy opened up and we were and exchanging ideas about how we would col collaborate between our organizations. So my organization has just been fortunate to get um, a large grant and we're going to be expanding our leadership program to about 750 young women in universities around Nigeria. And we're now talking to Baobab and asking them to train the trainers of our program in this process so that this is the way in which we're training young women in Nigeria to be leaders, leaders that elicit co um, cooperation, that listen and that can um, look for common ground from which to act. So, and Baobab has been willing, is willing to help us. And then even together, all of us sitting down in that group, we wrote a letter to the Nigerian president, who also happens to be the president of the African Union, explaining to him that um, Grasa Michelle Mandela is right in saying that we need to focus on women's role and not their rights, and that as a president of a country with men and women, it is inappropriate for him and it's appalling for him to say that women should advance their interests by pillow talk, even if it's in jest. It's completely inappropriate and a violation of women's rights. So Baobab um, took the responsibility of getting that letter into the media and all the women signed on. So with their signatures were countries like Tanzania, Zimbabwe, so that the Nigerian president sees that what he says impacts women beyond Nigeria. So it's, it was just very exciting for us and I, and I feel that it's just the beginning. There were many difficult issues we talked about. The fact that there's been a decline in the women's movement in Africa. We talked about also the gerontocracy within women's movement, the way in which younger women are not given spaces to grow by the older women within our movement and how we can bring about changes in that. But because we had learned all these tools about facilitation, these difficult conversations, we could have them, we could come to common ground or we could agree to disagree. And I feel that we're just really beginning a new way of being together that would allow us to navigate so many complex fault lines that have undermined our movement in the past. So um, I think that you should be looking out for the news, for, for news from African women because we're really on the move. Thank you. Juste dire que, à la demande de, de plusieurs euh, participantes ici, je vais parler en français. En fait, euh, en fait, c'est pas vrai. C'est parce que je ne peux pas parler anglais. <laughs> well, first of all, at the request of several of the participants here, I will speak in French. Actually, that's not true. It's just because I don't speak English. <laughs> euh, je voudrais, euh, je vais être très bref parce que je sais que la, la, la traduction prend du temps. 
Je voudrais remercier Mehnaz et WLP pour leur partenariat. Nous avons, en tant qu'association marocaine, l'Association démocratique des femmes du Maroc, nous avons commencé à travailler avec Mehnaz et avec son groupe et son réseau actuellement, qui est un grand réseau qui est en train de se développer. Et je, je, je voudrais témoigner ici pour dire que c'est un partenariat qui est absolument merveilleux. Et ce n'est pas toujours facile hein, de travailler donc, avec des partenaires euh, d'autres pays, à distance, c'est toujours très difficile. Mais franchement, comme j'ai dit hier, plus on travaille ensemble, plus on apprécie, disons, le, ce, ce travail ensemble, mieux on, on apprend à se connaître. Et je crois que les résultats sont absolument bénéfiques. I'll be brief because I know that it takes longer with the interpretation. I'd like to first of all thank WLP and Manaz and uh, this partnership. It's been a wonderful partnership. Uh, our association, the uh, a Democratic Association of Women in Morocco has been working with WLP for several years now. It's a very large network and it's a wonderful partnership. Um, we've seen that it's not always easy to work together across distances and with our uh, differences, but um, the more we work together, the more we get to know each other and we have seen very uh, positive results. Alors, je voudrais partager avec vous l'expérience, disons, de, euh, du mouvement des femmes. Je m'excuse de parler au nom du mouvement des femmes, mais bon, comme euh, j'ai l'occasion donc de le faire, je vais le faire. Le mouvement des femmes euh, au Maroc, euh, qui est, comme on en a parlé toute la journée, je ne vais pas y revenir, qui est un pays musulman, mais qui est aussi un pays arabe. Donc, euh, euh, je vais le dire comme ça, nous avons une double tare de, de l'extérieur comme ça. C'est toujours très difficile, être arabe et être euh, musulman. Donc je voudrais euh, expliquer, euh, enfin partager l'expérience euh, récente du Maroc qui est dans une situation très très intéressante. I'd like to talk to you um, as being part of the women's movement uh, in Morocco and um, I would like to talk about our experiences. We are both a Muslim country and an Arab country which is sort of a, a double strike if you will um, from, from the outside world's point of view. And I'd like to talk about some of our recent experiences we've had. Alors, le Maroc est, depuis que, mettons, les, les cinq dernières années, dans une situation de transition. Alors, transition vers quoi, ça, on ne sait pas encore. Mais il y a des, énormément de choses qui bougent et nous espérons que nous sommes dans une transition vers, vers une société plus démocratique. For the past five years, Morocco has been undergoing a transition. Now, we're not always sure exactly what we're transitioning to, but there has been a lot of movement and we are hopefully transitioning to a more democratic society. Et je crois que ce qui est très intéressant dans ce contexte, cette ère culturelle et religieuse, enfin dans le contexte arabo-musulman, la situation actuelle ou les leçons qu'on peut tirer, disons, de, du Maroc peuvent être très intéressantes pour les autres pays de la région. Et ce qui est intéressant dans ce contexte culturel et religieux, ce arab muslim contexte, c'est que nos expériences peuvent être pertinentes et utiles pour d'autres cultures aussi. Alors, pourquoi Parce que je pense, et on va y revenir vers la fin, que le mouvement des femmes, euh, a, a joué un rôle très important d'une façon globale dans cette transition vers, euh, disons, euh, un pays plus démocratique. And I say this because the women's movement overall has played a, an important role in this transition to a dem democratic country. Parce qu'il a pu, disons, travailler, euh, disons, en coalition. C'est un mouvement qui ne s'est pas isolé des autres acteurs euh, sociaux et politiques. Il a pu construire des co coalitions. Il a pu devenir euh, progressivement une véritable force de plaidoyer, de proposition. And I say this because the women's movement did not work in isolation, but rather worked with, was able to form coalitions with other groups, other partners in society, and became a very strong voice for advocacy for change. Alors donc, uh, si je viens, si je reviens à la question des violences, je dirais que par rapport à un pays comme le Maroc. Uh, euh, la, la, la question des violences, en fait, on la doit. Si elle est aujourd'hui est devenue une question politique, une question publique, elle est, de, elle est en train de devenir une question politique et publique. Ça, on le doit aussi au mouvement des femmes. And also coming back to the issue of violence, uh, the fact that uh, violence against women in Morocco has now become a political and is becoming a public issue is also uh, due in large part to the women's movement. Actuellement, bon, on peut dire que nous avons, bon, je ne dirais pas une spécificité, mais disons que chaque pays a un contexte qui est particulier. Le contexte marocain a cela de particulier que les femmes sont marocaines sont encore majoritairement analphabètes. And of course, every country has its own specificities. Uh, in Morocco, these are in particular the fact that a lot of the women are, illit are illiterate. Elles ne travaillent pas, elles n'ont pas de revenus euh, propres. Don't work, they don't have their own sources of income. Enfin, la majorité, il y a beaucoup de travail, mais la majorité ne travaille pas. Nous avons aussi 
euh, des difficultés qui sont liées, disons, euh, à, à la faiblesse des, des, des structures. Il n'y a pas de structure d'accueil, il n'y a pas de, de recours, il n'y a, a pas beaucoup de, de, de possibilités de recours pour les femmes. Um, there's also an, an issue of there not being appropriate structures in place. We have, uh, we have a shortage of centers for women, of places where they can seek help and get access to uh, resources. Et le plus important, et je crois que ça nous ramène au débat de la journée, qui disait pourquoi est-ce qu'on dit que les violences, euh, que le, les violences dans les pays musulmans, alors que les violences sont universelles, c'est vrai, mais dans certains pays, les violences sont aussi institutionnelles. Et je crois que c'est ça qui fait la, la, la spécificité, s'il faut cher, chercher. C'est-à-dire qu'au Maroc, les lois étaient violentes à l'encontre des, des, des femmes. Les lois étaient violentes et, et ça, c'est quelque chose qui est absolument difficile. C'est très difficile de travailler sur la question des violences quand les lois elles-mêmes sont, euh, sont violentes. And uh, also the, the third aspect, and this brings us back to the whole debate we've had today, why talk about violence against Muslim women when it's a universal phenomenon? That is because in some countries, violence is actually institutionalized. And in Morocco, this is the case. Our laws are actually violent towards women. And it's very difficult to eradicate violence against women when the laws themselves are violent towards women. Ce qui fait que lorsque le, les associations de droits des femmes ont commencé à ouvrir des centres d'accueil, de, d'écoute pour les femmes euh, euh, victimes de violence, on s'est rendu compte que les femmes ne venaient pas pour se plaindre de son mari qui l'a giflé ou qui l'a frappé. Elles venaient pour se plaindre des lois, de la pension alimentaire, du divorce, de la polygamie. C'était ça, en fait, leur, leur problème. Ce n'était pas les coups ou la violence domestique, c'était la violence des lois. And what we discovered when we started opening centers for women who were victims of violence is that they didn't come to complain about their husbands slapping them or hitting them around a little bit. A lot of them were coming to complain about the inequalities of the laws in terms of divorce, polygamy, social assistance, and etc. Et c'est pour ça que je crois que ça explique un petit peu les choix qui ont été faits, les stratégies qui ont été faits par les associations de femmes ou le mouvement des femmes au Maroc, c'est de travailler, de donner la priorité à, au changement des lois. Et je vais y venir uh, très brièvement. La loi euh, qui régit euh, ce qu'on appelle dans nos pays la moudouana, euh, qui régit le statu, le, les relations familiales et le statut des femmes, le code pénal et le code du travail. And that's why I think this is uh, why women's groups in Morocco chose uh, the path that we did, which was to focus more on changing legislation, to change what we call the moudouana, which is the laws that govern uh, family codes and uh, w governs women's status, as well as changing the labor codes and the penal code. Et donc, nous avons travaillé pendant plus près de 20 ans, disons, sur ces, pour le changement de, de, de ces lois. Et je crois que de, vous, vous avez certainement entendu parler de ça durant l'année dernière. En 2003 et 2004, nous avons pratiquement, euh, en l'espace de deux années, le Maroc, euh, disons, a, mis, a, a fait une sorte de mise, de mise à niveau, si on veut, de ces lois. Elles sont la, la loi sur la famille, enfin, de, la moudouana, le code de la famille, le code pénal et le code du travail sont devenus beaucoup moins discriminatoires que par le passé. And we've been working on this for the past 20 years uh, to reform our laws and you've probably heard about it recently in the past two years in 2003 and 2004. Morocco has essentially totally redone some of their laws, uh, in particular the Moudouana, the family law, the labor code and the penal code and they've become less discriminatory. Bien sûr, ici, euh, le, les officiels marocains euh, disent euh, ça, c'est on le doit, disons, euh, euh, au roi du Maroc, on le doit au gouvernement. Mais la vérité, c'est que le mouvement des femmes est derrière cela. Bien sûr, ça a rencontré une volonté politique, disons, de cette transition, parce qu'on s'est retrouvé dans une transition, il y a une volonté d'ouverture politique au Maroc. Mais il faut savoir que c'est un dossier sur lequel travaillent les associations des droits des femmes et les associations des droits de l'homme depuis près de 20 ans. And Moroccan officials will say that this is due to the efforts by the government and the King of Morocco, but in reality, <laughs> it was the women's movement that uh, really pushed for this. Obviously, we needed to have the political will in place, but it's, it's due in large part to the work of the women's movement and uh, human rights organizations for the past 20 years. Et donc, c'est pour nous, dans le, dans le contexte, je, je rappelle, c'est une grande victoire. Je pense que c'est même, on dit, c'est une révolution tranquille. Parce que changer dans un pays arabo-musulman actuellement, la moudouana ou le code de la famille, c'est vraiment une, une grande victoire. Et surtout le, que au Maroc, nous avons supprimé quelque chose qui était absolument inacceptable et qui, 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 qui justifiait, si vous voulez, la violence à l'égard des femmes. C'est une disposition de la loi qui disait que la femme devait obéissance à son mari. 
And this was a great victory for us. It was a peaceful revolution, if you will, because uh, to change the Mudwan of the family code in, in uh, our country was something that was really uh, very difficult. And so it was a huge victory for us. And in particular, we eliminated one practice that uh, is completely unacceptable and which really justified violence against women, which was the woman's duty to obey her husband. L'obéissance de la femme à son mari, c'est-à-dire qu'elle devait demander autorisation pour tout, le, la tutelle matrimoniale sur le, les femmes, le divorce euh, qui n'est pas judiciaire, la volonté du mari, le mari pouvait divorcer à, à n'importe quel moment, sans justifier sa volonté, sans dire pourquoi. Donc toutes ces choses-là étaient vraiment à la base de la violence. Et donc ces lois ont, 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 ont changé. Et ce qui est important, c'est que ce changement a été accompagné aussi du changement du code pénal qui est très très important aussi. And uh, so this duty for women to obey their husband uh, was something that was very discriminatory. Women had to seek authority or permission for anything. Um, there was a system of marital guardianship and uh, differences in terms of divorce. Men could seek divorce for any reason uh, legally and women could not. Uh, these were all practices that underpinned violence against women. And this has all been changed. And more importantly, what accompanied this was also a change in our penal code. Donc, dans le, le, le code pénal, il y a eu beaucoup de choses et je ne vais pas revenir en détail. Je dirais que la violence conjugale a été incriminée, c'est-à-dire les sanctions ont été augmentées, donc sont plus lourdes quand il s'agit de violence sexuelle. Le, har le, le harcèlement sexuel a été incriminé, euh, etc., etc. Donc, il y a de, beaucoup de nouvelles dispositions qui, qui renforcent, si vous voulez, et qui donnent, disons, une visibilité à la question des droits des femmes au Maroc, euh, aussi dans le code du travail. And the penal code, I'm not going to get into detail in terms of the reforms, but there were a lot of changes made. Uh, for example, domestic violence and sexual harassment were uh, criminalized and made uh, to be cr to crimes. A lot of new provisions were added, and this all gave greater visibility to the women's movement and to uh, women's issues. And uh, the same holds true for our labor code. Alors, donc, euh, nous sommes, euh, après donc, euh, la, la fin des deux dernières années, on se retrouvait un peu KO, si vous voulez. Euh, les associations de femmes, on s'est battu pendant 20 ans pour changer de loi. Elles ont été changées. C'est à peine si on, on, on y croyait. Donc, on croyait qu'on pouvait arriver, on pouvait gagner. Et donc, à la, à, à la suite de ces réformes, on s'est retrouvé un peu chaos, donc un peu désorienté. Que faut-il faire maintenant Comment continuer Parce qu'on ne peut pas dire que les problèmes ont été réglés. And now we find ourselves a little bit disoriented because women's organizations and associations have been working for 20 years to change these laws. We never really believed that they were going to be changed. And now that they actually have been changed, we're not quite sure what to do. And we're not quite sure how to keep working to keep the momentum going. Because the problems, obviously, have still not been solved. Et donc, c'est une nouvelle étape pour nous qui commence. Et je voudrais vous parler rapidement, disons, comment, donc, quelles que sont les nouvelles stratégies que nous voulons mettre en place pour continuer, parce que nous savons euh, et ça a été dit ce matin, les lois euh, étaient constituées de violences, mais la non-application des lois est une violence. Et je, je pense personnellement qu'il n'y a pas plus violent qu'une loi qui n'est pas appliquée, qu'une femme qui va devant le tribunal et qui n'arrive pas à obtenir euh, ses droits. Je crois que c'est ça, il me semble que c'est ça en fait la, la suprême euh, violence. And we're, so we are in a new phase now, and we're talking about what strategies we can adopt. And uh, as we were saying earlier today, Laws can be a source of violence, but to my mind, a greater source of violence is non-application of laws. It's fine to have the laws, but the worst type of violence is a woman who goes to court and can't have the law applied in her favor. So to my mind, that is the supreme violence, if you will. Donc, nous avons commencé à réfléchir comment euh, travailler pour surveiller la mise en œuvre et l'implantation de ces nouvelles dispositions qui sont merveilleuses. Mais qui ne, bon, on n'est pas sûr, on n'est pas dans le Maroc n'est pas encore en état de droit. Et on a beaucoup de chemin à faire pour pour cela. Donc comment faire pour à la fois euh, veiller à ce que ces femmes puissent bénéficier de nouveaux droits et contribuer aussi à cette transition démocratique en essayant de faire que la loi soit disons respectée dans notre pays. So we are working now to see how we can monitor application of these new laws, uh, these wonderful laws, to make sure that uh, women do benefit from them. Morocco is still not yet a democracy. We need to see how women can uh, have these laws um, applied in their favor and how we can continue to promote application uh, of these laws. Et je voudrais juste ouvrir une parenthèse pour dire que les, les, les conservateurs et l'islam et l'islam politique au Maroc, avant le changement des lois, surtout la loi sur de la famille, le code de la famille, disait 
C'est-à-dire qu'il y a une perception très virtuelle en disant que seul le retour à l'islam, le, le respect euh, de, disons, des, des préceptes de l'islam peuvent garantir une protection totale des femmes contre le, les, les, les violences et que si on touche au code de la famille, la violence va, euh, va augmenter. Mais ils n'ont jamais dénoncé réellement les violences réelles dont souffraient les femmes avant la, 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 la réforme de, du code de la famille. Après la réforme de code de la famille, ils essayent de dire, oui, maintenant, il va y avoir plus de violence, il va y avoir plus de, 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 de divorces. Donc, tout le monde est en train d'attendre, disons, les données, les statistiques, les choses, comment donc cette loi-là va être euh, appliquée. And uh, just to say a word, a quick word about Islamic conservative politicians in our country, a lot of people were calling for a return to Islamic principles, saying that uh, it is only by returning to Islamic principles that we can assure total protection for women against violence, but, uh, and that if we changed the family code, if we modified it, then there would be more violence against women. Uh, but they never really came out to denounce the real violence that was actually being committed against women. So now they're saying that since we've changed the laws, there's going to be more violence, there'll be more divorce, and we're all waiting now to see what's going to happen, to see the statistics, and to see how it evolves. Euh, et donc, euh, l'une des stratégies que nous sommes en train de mettre en place, et je vais terminer, mais là, je suis désolée, c'est la mise en place d'un grand réseau de, composé actuellement de, de 20 centres d'écoute de, 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 et d'accueil des femmes victimes de violences. C'est un réseau qui s'appelle euh, Anarouz, qui veut dire euh, euh, espoir. Nous l'avons constitué donc euh, avec les associations, les, les centres sur l'ensemble du territoire marocain et avec le, le soutien du, du, du Fonds des Nations Unies pour euh, la population au Maroc qui nous a apporté un très très grand soutien pour ce réseau-là. Et c'est un réseau qui a beaucoup d'objectifs parmi lesquels l'observation de la mise en œuvre de, des nouvelles euh, lois, le, la, la collecte de l'information et des statistiques et de l'information la, qualitative sur, euh, sur le, les violences et enfin vraiment continuer à faire le plaidoyer pour la mise en œuvre des lois et euh, la révision des lois qui sont encore, des dispositions qui sont encore inégalitaires. Et je vous remercie. And uh, just to sum up, and I'm sorry if I've spoken too long, but um, we, one of our strategies has been to create a large network called Anarouz, which means hope. Uh, so far, we have set up 20 women's centers throughout Morocco. We've received funding from the UN Population Fund. And among our objectives, we want to monitor application of these new laws. We want to be able to collect statistics and qualitative data about how these laws are implemented and the uh, impact on violence against women. And also, uh, our other objective is to lobby for new laws and for reform of the laws that are still discriminatory. Thank you. Merci. Um, thank you, Mahnaz and the Women's Learning Partnership for inviting me um, to share with you today um, some of the strategies adopted by the women's group, uh, groups in Malaysia um, that campaign for a domestic violence act, and in particular, the strategies we used um, to deal with the resistance from the religious authorities and conservative men, um, you know, to, to um, where they tried to prevent um, the application of that act to Muslim women. Yeah? Um, Malaysia is the first Muslim country to enact a domestic violence act in 1994, but even after the act was um, adopted by parliament, it took two more years of, of lobbying and, and, and struggling to get the act um, implemented. Um, uh, this, this, the success of the campaign for the act really, um, I think, just three main reasons. Um, we worked as a group to show the government um, that um, there is a movement here. And the, and, and the coalition, the Joint Action Group Against Violence Against Women, um, ranged at any time throughout that 11-year period of campaigning for a domestic violence act from 1985, ranged anything from five to 17 different groups. So it was a very fluid coalition. Um, and we took the initiative by drafting our own act, and that became the basis of negotiation um, with the government. Um, second, um, we adopted uh, massive public education campaigns um, to build awareness on domestic violence as a crime. Um, every year on Women's Day, we took advantage of International Women's Day on March 8th to have events. Um, in shopping complexes, um, public events, um, big walks, um, uh, concerts, um, uh, you know, just in, in, again to build awareness, but also to generate media publicity because we wanted to cap 
to keep the issue alive in the media. Um, and this um, uh, brings to um, the, the third strategy of the media strategies, and this is really important in terms of trying to bring change, especially within conservative societies, that you cannot do it, first you can't do it alone, of course, but you have to do it in public. Yeah, that change is not going to happen by you know, the government, the religious authorities, all these say, look, we know there's a problem, let's discuss behind four walls. Why do you have to take it to the public and embarrass the community um, by discussing these problems publicly? So the importance of going to the media, building public support, and really putting pressure in the end for the authorities to concede um, to, to the demands. Um, what were the objections? Yeah. Um, one, I mean, the objections came really from the religious authorities centered on two issues. One was a conflict of jurisdiction. They argued that domestic violence was a family matter, very common, I think, in many countries, and should therefore come under the jurisdiction of the Islamic family law. And moreover, they claimed the Islamic family law provided adequate remedies and protection to Muslim victims of domestic violence. And therefore, there is no need for this Domestic Violence Act to apply to Muslims, because Muslims can find remedies within the Islamic family law. Um, second, the belief, of course, that Muslim men are allowed to beat their wives, to chastise their wives, based on an interpretation or misinterpretation of a verse um, in the Quran, verse 434. Um, let me just share with you some of the... Um, strategies because time is running out, so I'm trying to cut short my what I've got, what I have prepared here. Some of the strategies that we took, and Sisters in Islam, um, as part of the Joint Action Group, basically took the lead um, in dealing with the religious authorities and to build that public constituency within the Muslim community in Malaysia to support um, um, the Domestic Violence Act, which makes domestic violence a crime. Um, number one, we did research on Quranic verses that were used to justify domestic violence and came up with arguments, basically, you know, uh, providing alternative interpretations of the verse um, in, in the Quran that is used to justify domestic violence. And we came up, as part of that, of that campaign, we came up with this booklet and this kind of like began our work um, where we issue just very small leaflets, book, booklets, question and answer to deal with issues, um, contentious issues in Islam, and to basically bring the progressive scholarship in Islam, the alternative interpretations in, in Islam to the public space through language that's, you know, sim simple, simpler language rather, um, so that the ordinary uh, Muslim, the ordinary person can read it in, a, in an easy um, way and understand the issue. Um, and of course, this, we did this in 1991, and really, um, as a strategy since then, of course, there's been really a growth of um, progressive scholarship on various interpretations um, of this verse. Um, you know, traditionally, of course, the word in the verse, daraba, you know, it means to hit, to beat, but now you find a whole range of interpretation what that word could possibly mean. And this is, again, a strategy that women's groups in campaigning against domestic violence can, again, like um, Aisha Imam said in the morning, to, to put out into the public space the possibilities for alternative interpretations. Yeah? And why is it that that word daraba, which is used, I think, about 40 different times in the Quran with many different meanings, should only mean to beat? in that um, verse 434. Um, another strategy that we use, again, this is again in creating that public space um, for women to speak on Islam, to have our voice heard in the discourse and the debate on what Islam means um, to us and how Islam should govern our lives um, as citizens. Um, is, um, we use letters to the editor. Um, and. Um, Again, again, because of the work that we do is to provide alternative interpretations, alternative juristic opinions on contentious issues in Islam, whether it's domestic violence, polygamy, um, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, um, dress, uh, modesty, equality. And because these ideas are relatively new within the Muslim community who've been brought up and educated, you know, um, with a very traditional misogynistic understanding of Islam, 
Um, and because we were very small as well, we felt that the best way um, to get our voice uh, and our ideas out in the public space was to use the newspapers, to use the media. And um, we, we, we issue letters to the editor, and again, because of the complexity of the issue of dealing with Quranic verses, dealing with the traditions of the Prophet, um, dealing with juristic principles, different juristic um, arguments that have developed throughout the history of Islam, we need that space. So we thought that you know, issuing press statements alone to enter the debate was not adequate. To, 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 to give the complexity of our arguments. So we use this strategy and for a long time the newspapers have actually um, been, been very supportive in you know, putting out our letters in full. Now of course they've wisened up and said look your letters are too long, you've got to cut them short. You know? So we don't have that kind of space anymore and of course the novelty of, of our presence also is wearing off, um, you know, so, but, but that is very important. And again, in terms of the domestic violence, you know, some of the arguments that we used, I've, I've got two letters in here. Um, we, we submitted two letters to the editor on the, the campaign for the domestic violence. I, you know, we use verses in the Quran that focus on kindness, compassion, mercy, re, you know, in the relationship between men and women. We also offered an alternative contextual interpretation of the verse that's used to justify domestic violence. And also, um, you know, and Malaysia is a multiracial country, so in some ways, the fact that non Muslims can advance forward with law reform without having to deal with the whole religion part. You know, while it disadvantages Muslims, in a way we use that, that fact to basically shame the religious authorities and shame the government um, as well. That, you know, so for example, I mean, we, we were basically asking the government, are you saying in not wanting the Domestic Violence Act to apply to Muslims, are you saying that it is a crime for a Chinese man to beat his wife, but it's very Islamic for a Muslim man um, to beat his wife? And that really shamed um, the religious authorities and shamed the government. Um, and also, um, the whole idea that uh, this is part of the family, so therefore, um, you know, it should, it should be under um, the juris jurisdiction of religious laws or family law. Again, Malaysia had enacted the Child Protection Act, which made abuse of a child a crime. Now, a child is very much a part of the family, so why is it that it is absolutely fine to have a Child Protection Act that makes abuse of a child a crime, but it is not Islamic, you know, to put abuse of a spouse um, as a crime um, and, and, and take it out of the family, Islamic family law jurisdiction. Um, so basically, in the end, the onslaught of letters, articles, editorials demanding the implementation of the Domestic Violence Act to include Muslims finally really push um, the government um, to shame the religious authorities, to put pressure on the religious authorities to concede um, to our demands. So finally, after 11 years, 11 long years of campaigning, in June 1996, the Domestic Violence Act came into force. But of course, <laughs> having a law, as um, our friend said, is just the first step. Um, and, of, and, and, and if society and culture has not changed enough to enable women, to empower women to access those laws, then those laws just remain rights on paper. Um, so, you know, of course there have been problems. I mean, definitely since the enactment of the law, there is awareness that domestic violence is a crime. So that alone, the presence of the law alone, does act as a, a, a disincentive. Yeah? People are aware. And the existence of the law alone, also over the years, you know, in the first few years, there was police resistance um, in taking down domestic violence reports. Again, through um, public awareness campaigns, through media, uh, media reports and all that, basically now you really don't hear, uh, hardly hear any report of police stations not wanting to take down uh, a domestic violence report. Um, but you know the, the 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 but the challenges remain, and the women's groups um, over the years have submitted several memorandums to the government to deal um, for law, you know further amendments with the Domestic Violence Act. You know we want. Um, um, to expand the definition of domestic violence to include mental, psychological, emotional forms of violence. In fact, Indonesia um, just passed a Domestic Violence Act, I think in October or November last year, where um, economic abandonment as well is included as a form um, of violence. And that's a major, you know, major progress. Um, 
and also some of the problems like um, in, in terms of implementation. Um, for example, again, to deal with a conservative society where, um, you know, um, having, you know, domestic, turning domestic violence into a crime is seen as breaking up the family. Um, what the government did was to give um, powers to the welfare department to come in. And the woman has to go to a welfare officer and the welfare officer will take her to apply for an interim protection order to prevent the abuser from abusing her again. And this, of course, has led to delays um, in getting the protection order. So, you know, we've been wanting reform um, that, you know, a, a victim of violence should be able to get a protection order within 24 hours. And she doesn't, they had, you know, she, she in her own right, um, you know, should be able um, to, to get that order without the intervening, intervention of a welfare officer. And my time is running up. <laughs> okay. And, and there are also problems. I mean, one of the things that the women's group had to concede, um, uh, you know, was to attach the Domestic Violence um, Act to the penal code. Again, again, to deal with the resistance from the religious authorities, because it's very clear that the penal code is a criminal offense. So therefore, it is not um, under is not an Islamic matter, it's a federal criminal matter. But in attaching the Domestic Violence Act to the criminal code, it again has led, um, to the penal code, it again has led to problems of defining, you know, seizable, non-seizable offense, you know, whether the use of weapons and injuries are there. And if it is a seizable offense, if there are injuries, then you can, the police can investigate immediately, but if there are no physical injuries and no weapons are used, you have to get an order to investigate. And this, again, delays the process because 80% of domestic violence um, 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 reports does not, there's no um, visible injury or there are no weapons um, used. So all these problems that we have to deal with, and just recently the government, um, you know, at our pushing, the cap government finally establish a cabinet committee on gender equality. Um, and so we're pushing, the women's groups are now pushing for all these um, reform, law reform and procedural changes through that cabinet um, committee. And hopefully, you know, within the, <laughs> cross our fingers, within the next few years that we get some of these um, changes and amendments that have been pushing for over the years, uh, you know, to get them implemented um, within the next few years. Thank you.